The nation is reflecting on the life of former Secretary of State Colin Powell. The 84-year-old died Monday due to complications from COVID-19. Powell also battled multiple myeloma, a type of blood cancer that compromises the immune system. In a statement, Powell's family thanked medical staff at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, where he was being treated. They also called him a remarkable and loving husband, father, grandfather, and a great American. CBS News national security correspondent David Martin takes a look back at his life. Already dealing with cancer, Colin Powell succumbed to the coronavirus this morning at Walter Reed, where he had been hospitalized since last Monday. The 84-year-old was a role model for younger African Americans like Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. The world lost one of the greatest leaders that we have ever witnessed. And I lost uh, a tremendous personal friend and mentor. He's not only a dear friend and a patriot, one of our great military leaders and a man of overwhelming decency. Raised in Harlem in the Bronx as a child of immigrant parents, Powell joined the ROTC program at City College of New York, became a soldier, did two tours in Vietnam, and went on to become one of this country's most prominent leaders. First black national security advisor, first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, first black secretary of state. So help me God. He considered a run to become the first black president, but decided he didn't have the political fire in his belly. I will not be a candidate for president or for any other elective office in 1996. Powell became a household name during the first Gulf War when he pointed at a map showing the location of the Iraqi army. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off, and then we're going to kill it. Desert Storm, as it was called, lasted just seven weeks. And in an interview on the 25th anniversary of the war, Powell acknowledged it may have created a false impression that the next war would be just as quick. Do you think Desert Storm created unrealistic expectations about what military force can... It may have in the mind of some. It didn't uh, in, in my mind. Uh, I understood the nature of that war, how limited it was, and it wasn't a model of what we can do in every other conflict that comes along. He developed the Powell Doctrine, a series of questions to be asked before the United States goes to war. One of them... Is there a plausible exit strategy to avoid endless entanglement? Stands out as a red flag, warning against the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. Powell was Secretary of State then and delivered a key speech at the UN, outlining what turned out to be false intelligence that Saddam Hussein was hiding weapons of mass destruction. Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. Powell later told a friend that speech was a black mark on my record that will never go away. But that didn't stop presidential candidates from craving his endorsement. And although he rose to the top under Republican presidents, he ended up endorsing two Democrats who became president, Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Elaine? David Martin, thank you. Ambassador John Negroponte joins me now. He served as Deputy National Security Advisor to Colin Powell. He also served as the Director of National Intelligence under President George W. Bush. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, your reflections, first of all, today, um, Ambassador, as someone who worked very closely with Colin Powell, knew him personally, what will you remember most about him? Well, first of all, I would I, I remember the inspiration that he was for all of those who worked with him and for him. Uh, he was a, a charismatic figure. He was very considerate of others. He was a team player. He just uh, believed in keeping the ball moving down the field. Uh, he related extremely well to both his civilian and military colleagues. As somebody who reported directly to Colin, both as deputy national security advisor and then as ambassador to Iraq and, uh, and, and ambassador to the United Nations before that, uh, I was uh, just totally impressed by his leadership skills. Both in Iraq and in New York, I, I spoke to him practically every day on the telephone. That was his leadership style. 
And uh, I just felt uh, I had his back every step of the way. Uh, great man to work for, lovely person to know. Well, he was someone who was respected by both Democrats and Republicans alike throughout his career. Why do you think that was? How did he manage to do that? Well, first of all, I don't think of Colin, even though he had an affiliation with the Republican Party, I don't think of him as a partisan figure. He was a professional soldier. And that's where he first distinguished himself. And I think he continued on in that tradition a little bit like George uh, Catlett uh, Marshall or uh, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was that kind of person. He was a national figure. He had charisma. He had national recognition. I think politicians wanted to associate with Colin because uh, they hoped that some of uh, his incredible popularity would stick to them. And uh, so, I, I, again, I just want to emphasize, I just simply cannot think of Colin as a partisan figure. Well, I do want to ask you about his 2003 speech to the United Nations that cited faulty intelligence in the run-up to the Iraq War. We heard a bit about this from David Martin in his um, closing there a moment ago. But how did that moment impact Colin Powell? Well, you saw me in that photograph sitting right behind him. I was a representative mm -hmm. to the U.N. at the time. And George Tennant was right. there, the head of the CIA. He scrubbed that speech. He went to the CIA uh, numerous times before he gave it to check it out. He uh, gave the, that report to the United Nations uh, in good faith. He thought what he was saying was true. It turned out to be false. He's sort of taking the fall for that, and he, he kind of blames himself. And I, I can see why it happened on his watch, and he's the one who delivered the remarks. But I think the people in the intelligence community ought to step up once and for all and candidly admit that they gave him false information and that they regret having done that. I think uh, they're, they're much more responsible than he is for the fact that we uh, sold the American people a bill of goods when it came to Iraq WMD. And they ought to say that forthrightly and candidly and not let Colin continue to take the blame. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, since you raised that point, I wonder if you can tell us, did General Powell express that kind of sentiment to you, that um, he felt as though perhaps, you know, um, that he had not been um, supported in, in the way that he should have been? Well, that, I mean, he certainly said that he did, he felt that he had not been properly served by the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, but after uh, the fact, he, I mean. He had lost, and he had lost... Uh, he lost complete confidence in them after that experience. All right, let's talk about his years as Secretary of State. In what ways, Mr. Ambassador, do you think that he helped shape the State Department into what it is today? Well, I think, first of all, uh, there was tremendous morale while he was there. He related extremely well to the personnel of the, uh, all the personnel in the building and at the embassies. Uh, around the world. He was a beloved figure. He had a kind of a uh, totally hands-on approach to uh, running the department. And he got to know dozens, if not hundreds, of people who worked in the building uh, personally. I mean, you, you got to have been around Colin Powell to understand how charismatic his style was. I remember he came out to the embassy in Baghdad when I was serving as ambassador there. And he we brought about, uh, uh, around the uh, him a several hundred military people and, and others to listen to him talk. Uh, uh, and he just uh, was uh, spellbinding in the way he spoke to people, off the cuff, no prepared remarks. But he was always good for uh, just a terrific uh, spellbinding presentation. That's the kind of guy he was. Well, how do you think Colin Powell would want the world to remember him? Well, I think they'd want to remember him First and uh, foremost, as uh, a, a, ter a terrific soldier who won the first Gulf War, uh, along with, obviously, the, the troops and others who, who, who fought it. But he certainly led the effort here in Washington. I think he'd want to be remembered as uh, somebody who uh, uh, ran a, a State Department uh, very effectively, and, and, and he was a popular leader. 
And I think we ought to also remember his role as national security advisor because he was the national security advisor for the last 14, 15 months of Ronald Reagan's administration, which was a period of great accomplishment uh, in breaking down some of the barriers with the Soviet Union, including a major arms control agreement. And so I think that was sort of pathbreaking towards uh, the eventual end of the Cold War, which occurred in the next administration. But he played a, an important role in that. All right. Former Ambassador John Negroponte, thank you so much for taking the time to share your reflections with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you very much.